Love, my brothers and sisters, is a choice and not a decision. Author John Mertz defines the word decision, the act or need for making of one's mind. However, choice is the right power or opportunity to choose. When you dive deeper into the words, the origins of the two words are quite different. We often think choice and decision are the same thing. Well, decision comes from the word cutting off, while choice comes from to proceed. And taking the origins and definitions together, we will get more clarity in what it means in choosing to love God versus deciding to love God. Decisions versus choices, that's what today's message is about because many of you have gotten used to making decisions but really haven't understood the power of choice. Decisions versus choices is where we are wrestling with on this Christian journey because it is more of a process than just a problem. Meaning that when we make decisions, we are going through an analysis to eliminate and to deduce and to cut off options. When we got bills to pay, we sometimes decide which ones we're going to pay first. We decide which ones we're going to let go into collections, amen, and decide which ones we're going to pay to keep the lights on, amen, somebody. But with choice, it is more of a mindset approach, meaning that that we have a perception of what the right or wrong choice may be when somebody owes us money and we don't want them to decide whether or not they're going to pay us back. We want them to choose to repay us what we let them borrow. God does not decide to love us because he does not want to cut us off from all of his blessings. God chooses to love us because he has our best interests in mind. God has our future, amen, in his heart. True love, brothers and sisters, requires the lover to think about what is best for the one that is being loved. Human love is not like divine love. Human love is selfish. Human love is self-centered. Human love is driven to please the flesh. But divine love is something different. Divine love, God's love, is selfless and unconditional. God looks beyond our faults and sees our very need. This is why Jesus Christ becoming flesh and living among us is so important because why would God give up a throne in glory to come and know our story? It's because God loves us unconditionally. Unconditional love is power on top of power. Unconditional love is purposeful and has your best interest in mind. And while we are down here complaining and uh, taking God for granted and being ungrateful, God still loves us unconditionally. God is love. It's a powerful proposition because no one can ever love you like God can. Somebody says, well, mama loves me, but mama will let you know when she ain't feeling you. Amen, somebody. When somebody says, well, daddy loves me, well, daddy's love often pacifies you and it prevents and stunts your growth. And when we talk about God in the context of how our parents raised us, we miss the full aspect of the fullness and the love and the majesty of God because many times we were chastised and resented our parents. Many times we had something taken away from us and we held it against them. But when God chastises us it's for our good. And when God takes something from us, he's going to replace it with something better. I don't get nobody saying nothing. When we are going, growing in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are learning more and more about the unlimited love of God. A story told about a man who approached a very beautiful woman in the grocery store. 
He says to the lady, excuse me, I lost my wife here in the supermarket. He says, can you talk to me for a few minutes? The lady said to him, why do you want to talk to me? And he says, because every time I talk to a beautiful woman, my wife shows up out of nowhere. Such things that God is watching you. When you realize that God is always watching you, you will govern yourself accordingly. Amen, somebody. So I don't love because of who's looking at me. I love because God lives on the inside of me. And I don't have to worry about who's watching me because I know that God is always watching me. God is calling us as a church to return back to a loving relationship with him. In 1975, Andre Crouch, the great gospel, um, the great gospel musician and gospel uh, writer, he, he wrote a song called Take Me Back, Dear Lord. The song says, take me back, take me back, dear Lord, to the place where I first received you. Take me back, take me back, dear Lord, where I first believed. Many believers, my brothers and sisters, have fallen out of love with God for many different reasons. Some have never established a reason to love God. I call that ignorance. And some have been burdened down by the hardships of life and have fallen away from the faith. I call that interference. And thirdly, others have allowed what others believe about God to dictate their beliefs and their theology. I call that idolatry. So I don't know who I'm preaching to here today. I don't know if your issue is ignorance that you are not aware of how much God really loves you. I don't know if your issue is interference. You always got to mess on top of mess coming into your life that's keeping you from praising God like you should. I don't know if your issue is idolatry. You got other people that are blocking your view of heaven and seeing what the Lord has in store for you. That may be your idolatrous issue, but God is calling us to move from the dependence on idols and the dependence on interference and the dependence on ignorance and calling us to be excited about an interpersonal relationship with the ever-living, ever-loving, holy and righteous God. Hosea chapter 11 records the prophecies against Israel by the prophet Hosea. God tells Hosea in chapter 1 to go and marry a wife of whoredom. His wife's name is Goma, and theologians have often debated that was Goma a prostitute before Hosea married her, or did she become a prostitute after he married her? And my professor, Dr. Harold Bennett, said that the love Love motif is stronger when you visit the fact that he had to buy her back from the auction block after she had gone to a life of harlotry. It is a stronger message in the prophecy when we have a woman named Goma who goes back in to a lifestyle of prostitution after Hosea has given her matrimony. Amen, somebody. And so it is with us. When God blesses us, amen somebody, when God brings us out of the darkness and into the marvelous light, sometimes we get like that prodigal son, the pig pen becomes fascinating to us. The pig pen, the hog pen of the world, we want to dive back into. We go back to our old ways, amen somebody. I got some holy and righteous people here today. Nobody here got a fifth in their pocket, but nobody here got any cigarettes in their pocket. Amen. Nobody here goes by the strip club every now and again. We got some saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled church members today. Amen. But Goma, everybody say Goma. Goma backslided. She, she went back into her old ways and her husband, Hosea, had to buy her back from harlotry because it was representative of God's never in love for Israel. Goma had two children that did not belong to Hosea and God 
was saying that in those birthing of those children, so it is with the, the children of Israel because Israel was not acting like the children of God. Hosea tells the people that they will be delivered over to Assyria who will oppress them as Egypt did. And yet the Lord refuses to destroy Israel. He promises a new exodus for the believing remnant. Hosea 11 and 1 is understood in the New Testament as a messianic prophecy in that Jesus, God's son, like Israel, was brought out of Egypt in the context of hatred. Whereas Israel was free from Egypt, became slaves to sin Jesus practiced righteousness so that he could die as a substitute to sacrifice for the atonement of their sins touch neighbor say Jesus died for us how do we return to God with a heart of love and a heart of repentance that's what we need to answer the day before leaving here. And the three things I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, first is you got to look for God's love in every situation. Amen. Touch your neighbor say, look for God's love in every situation. Amen. There was a song by Roberta Flack and Donna Hathaway. Some of y'all are telling y'all age, and the song asked the question, where is the love? She asked the question and said, where is the love that you said was mine or mine until the end of time? Where is the love? Where is the love? Sometimes when we are mistreated, we ask the question, where is the love? Sometimes when we are neglected, we ask the question, where is the love? Sometimes when we have been lied on, we ask the question, where is the love? And the answer is, it's all around you. It may not be in the people that are mistreating you. It may not be in the people that are neglecting you. It may not be in the people that are lying on you, but the presence of God is all around you. How do we know that? Because in verse 4, in verse 3, excuse me, it says, I was, it was I, who I taught Ephraim to walk, taking them in, in my arms, but they never knew that I healed them. I led them with love and human cords, with ropes of kindness to them I was like the one who eases the yoke from their jaws. I bent down to give them food. The word love that's used in this verse is the Hebrew word ahava, which means lovesick. Amen, somebody. I'm coming down the street. Stay down right there. Anybody ever been lovesick before? Amen. You know you have been mistreated. You know that you have been done wrong. You know you've been lied to, but you, you've been lied on, but you couldn't stop thinking about it. They met somebody. You were, you were sick with tears. You couldn't eat nothing. You couldn't sleep. You was like uh, Robert Kelly. You, you couldn't go home because of uh, how you felt about that other person. But when we look at this word a little bit deeper, it also means, it exactly means the love of an adulterous person. So when you know that the one that you love doesn't love you as much as you love them. Touch your neighbor and say, that hurts. Ouch, somebody. And some of us ain't got no room for ouch love in our lives because everything has got to be about us. It's got to be about us when we wake up and when we lie down. It's got to be us in the morning and at noon, day, and at night. We are maybe we're just going to put an M.E. t-shirt on because we think it's all about me. But when you really to love somebody, it's not about you. It's about what's good for the both of you. It's about a relationship. And to be in a relationship means that you are trying to connect with somebody outside of yourself. This is where the church is missing the boat. Is that we become so self-centered and selfish that we don't understand how to love somebody else. When our prayer should be to God, it's that we ought to look for his love in every situation. See, so what was happening, brothers and sisters, the children of Israel were being taken into captivity. 
Israel was the northern kingdom and the Assyrians had been prophesied to be the ones that would take the children of Israel into captivity and here in captivity they would learn humility in captivity there would be a remnant that would trust and praise God in captivity they would learn from their idolatrous ways they would learn from their mistakes and they would learn that even in a moment of chastity God still loves us some of y'all got whooped by mama and thought she hated your guts but mama often gave you a speech and said I'm doing this because I love you and when you look back at the other children who mama didn't care nothing about them let them stay out all night long and let them have sex at 10 years old and have their boyfriends spend the night over the house while they was in middle school you look at them now they got 13 children they ain't got but one eye and one leg they only 37 years old Look for God's love in every situation. When God is looking at us, he's looking at us in a position and a posture of love. One who is loving one who has done wrong to him. But he doesn't stop loving us because he is chastising us. Secondly, we got to live for God with the heart of repentance. That's what they say, live for God with the heart of repentance. My brothers and sisters, some of us say we sorry, but we're really not sorry. We sorry in the colloquial sense of sorry. We, 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 we pay people back after we go to the mall and shop. We, we, we show up late and we leave early. Just maybe say that's sorry. But the sorry that God is looking for is a change of heart, mind, and actions. That means when our attitude has shifted back up towards heaven, when our altitude is focused towards the hills, where our help comes from, where our mind is focusing on perfect peace, that we keep our mind stayed on Jesus. But when we're living for God, we're not worried about the burdens of life because we understand that even though we're not all that we want to be, we can look back over our lives and see the things that God has forgiven us of and say, thank God I'm not what I used to be. Verse number 7 tells us, brothers and sisters, my people are bent on turning from me. Though they call to him on high, he would not exalt them at all. My brothers and sisters, the people of God had strayed from the very God who had brought them out of the land of Egypt that had parted the Red Sea, let them walk through on dry ground, closed up Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea, gave them manna in the desert, water from a rock, quail for meat, Opened up the Jordan River the same way that he did the Red Sea. Gave them the city of Jericho as they marched around the wall for six days. And then seven times on the seventh day. And the walls came tumbling down. The same God who led them by a cloud by day and a fire by night. The same God who caused the sun to shine and the world to twirl. The same God that put the stars in the sky. The same God that allowed the wind to blow. The same God that gave the birds a song to sing. The same God that put the green in the grass, the milk in the cow, and the meow in the cat, the bark in the dog. The same God that did all of that. They often took him for granted. And when people Take God for granted. They don't live for God. They don't feel a sense of conviction about the things that they have done wrong. People backslide. They turn away. They fall away from the faith. This is an attitude of apostasy. Look at our churches beyond Christmas, Mother Day, and Easter. Our pews are not packed the way that they used to be. The purpose of going is not there to be because people are not living for God the way they used to. When you're living for God with the heart of repentance, you're not perfect. But you understand how to come to God and say, God, I'm sorry. Lord, I messed up. 
I want to make it right with you. I want to get on my knees and come back in the right relationship with you. But when we fail to sincerely repent with our attitude and our actions, God does not hear our prayers. Live for God with the heart of repentance. Thirdly, love God with fear and trembling. Just never say, love God with fear and trembling. See, my brothers and sisters, the real question for today's church is not what church you go to. It's not who's your pastor. It's not are you a deacon or a trustee or a pew member. The question really is, is do you really love God? That's the question that we have to ask ourselves and answer with the attitude of sincerity. Do we really love God when we're complaining about this and about that? Do we really love God when we're looking to do less and not more? Do we really love God when we're always coming in with attitude and edge when somebody is in need? Uh, see, we really have to revisit what relationship we really have with God because uh, if we're always the one that's doing the receiving, then we are takers. <laughs> when we're giving back to God in the same attitude that God has given to us, that's called reciprocity. Touch name say reciprocity. See, a reciprocal relationship is about giving and receiving. It's not looking at God like Santa Claus, amen. It's looking at God as one who has the authority to answer our prayers, but one who is worthy of receiving praise because of the prayers he's already answered. See, what God does, he loves us unconditionally even before we obey. But when he hears a heart of obedience and he sees a mind that is mission-minded and purpose-driven, he gives us a, a supernatural blessing. Touch your neighbor say supernatural blessing. I have some good news for you and I got it right here in the verse number 11. It tells us that they will be roused like birds from evil and like doves from the land of Assyria. And he says, then I will settle them in their homes. My brothers and sisters, when you hear the word tremble, it, it, your Bible may say tremble. Everybody say tremble. When, when it talks about tremble, it comes from the word karad, which means to be terrified or to be careful or under supernatural influence. So when I'm in an attitude of love and when I'm in an attitude of worship, when I know that I'm in right relationship with God, I'm not perfect, I'm not all that I want to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. I'm loving God with a sense of fear and trembling. The New Testament tells us to work out our own soul salvation with fear and trembling. And the problem with today's church is, is that we don't fear God like we should. We say anything to anybody. We act like any everybody when we go anywhere. But when we get on the bus on Saturday, you better act like you fear God. Because if you don't, you might be on the bus. So they say, love God with fear and trembling. See, I'm talking about a trembling that's an attitude of reverence. I'm talking about a trembling that recognizes that God is in it and everywhere at the same time. I ain't got to go to the hospital to pray for somebody when they understand that God is a very present help in the time of trouble. I ain't got to go down to the prisons to go see somebody to let them know that God is a very present help in the time of trouble. Tell the neighbor, say, neighbor, you better be careful because God is in the midst of your situation. See, when I come in with a supernatural understanding that the same God that blessed Elijah with the ability to do five miracles, it's the same God that blessed Elisha to do 12 miracles. Is there anybody here today that knows that God is a healer? Is there anybody here today that knows that God is a right now way maker? Is there anybody here that knows God that wants us to be even in the midnight hour sometimes when we don't know where our ears are going to be? We don't know where our blessing is coming from. We ought to be able to stand in that moment and say, taste and see 
and that the Lord is good. I heard the old songwriter say that I love the Lord. He heard my cry and pitied every groan. Long as I live while troubles rise, I hasten to his throne. According to Hosea, dependence on the foreign alliances meant trusting in deceit and violence that amounted to playing with fire. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, I don't know about you, but I'm not playing with fire anymore. Because when you play with fire, that causes some damage. When you play with fire, you end up getting a burn. I don't know about you, but I get tired of messing people. People. I get tired of messy situations, but I know that in the midst of my mess, God still loves me. God still looks beyond my faults and sees every one of my needs. And again, Hosea is exhorting the threefold repentance of the children of Israel. He rebukes Israel by pointing out that although their name says Jacob, whose name means God, has changed to Israel and God later changed to Israel had been a faithless and self-centered deceiver he had met God and was converted see Jacob met one who wrestled with God but Israel means prince with God and some of us are still wrestling we still are trying to hold and get our piece of the pie we still trying to find fry fish in the kitchen it's still trying to burn some beans on the grill. But my brothers and sisters, I'm here today to let you know that who the real bean burner is, who the real fish fryer is, it ain't the Jeffersons, it ain't George and Weezy, it's God that provides every blessing. Come here, Kirk Carr, as he said, for every mountain that you brought me over, for every trial that you've seen me through for every blessing the songwriter said hallelujah it says for this I give you praise Hosea chapter 11 is the one of the greatest chapters in the Bible it begins in a mood of divine reminiscence God calls and recalls his tender relationship with Israel whom he called out of Egypt. The two metaphors that are used in this book are the love of the father and the care of the master. I'm closing here now to tell you that God loves you and that love is unconditional but God also is going to take care of you. God's goodness is contrasted with uh, Israel's ingratitude and then there was another gospel artist by the name of Walter Hawkins he had a song that said be grateful and that song in verse number one said God has not promised me sunshine it said that's not the way it's going to be it says a little rain mixed with God's sunshine will help you appreciate the good times and I don't know about you but I can stand here and say that today I can praise God in the midst of a storm I ain't got to have sunshine all the time I know how to go through in order to get to where God wants me to be is there anybody out there that's like me that's going through something some of you might be like Joe Ligon. You're saying I've been in the storm too long. But Joe didn't leave us there. He said, Lord, give me a little more time to pray. Is there anybody here that's praying in the midst of a storm? You say that when the storms of life are raging and the billows cease to roll, you say, that can pray 